the first thing we're going to have is um, a member moment. Uh, you're ready for that, Tricia? You betcha. And I will explain what that is for our new member. Um, a member moment is simply a short five to 10 minute presentation of any theme that you would like to share with the club, just to help the club get to know each other's members better, especially since we're Zooming. Um, it's an idea that's been in the club for a long time, and uh, we used to have them, but um, we haven't recently. So uh, Trisha's going to um, do her, so I'll let her do that. And then after that, I'll, I'll introduce our program for this evening, who um, you've already met, Steve Gibbs, and he's going to do a presentation. So I'll, I'll wait to introduce him after uh, Trisha. Okay, I'll share my screen. You can see it? Yes, yeah. and see it. Okay, so we go. So my presentation is called I Love Infrared. And uh, what it is, is just a little bit of information on my camera conversion to IR, and then a slideshow called Solitary Spaces that will demonstrate why I love infrared. Um, the camera that I got converted uh, by Life Pixel was my Nikon D7000. And um, I got, I, what really interests me is high contrast black and white. So um, I got that filter, it was 830 nanometers. Um, I also converted it with a lens, which they recommended. So I used uh, my, Tamron 18 to 270 lens. Um, some of the things I love is you can shoot any time of day as long as you've got light. Um, it turns a, a blue sky to black and um, green foliage to white and it makes puffy clouds just beautiful. Um, and if you want to create a sense of peaceful solitude, IR is the way to go. Nice. Nice balance. Nice line. Mm -hmm. Somebody have music playing? The, the presentation does. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's nice. It's awesome. I love it. Mm, mm. Worked well. Oh, now I hear it. Mm. Mm. I think you can share your computer audio, Trish, and it'll sound will come through better uh, as one of the options for uh, sharing your screen. There's view options. Let's see it. Settings, I think. Oh, sorry. All right, I'm going to try it, see if there's a. I don't see it, any choice like that. You you see view, view, view options. View options, upper right corner, I think. Where it says share screen. 
Um, no, I'm not seeing that at all. Okay. So keep going. Sure. I like that. Yeah, that's a great one right there. Oh, how cool is that? Oh, I like how the clouds mimic the wheels. Yeah, that's nice. Fire. <laughs> Very cool. Looks like someone's raising cottonwood. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like winter to me. That's yeah. Cool. Well, that really emphasizes a track. Yeah. yeah. Looks like an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's cool. Really striking. Oh, that's positive. <laughs> that's great. Oh. That's nice. Wow. Well, uh, can we ask questions? Sure. Trisha, those are really stunning. I mean, mm -hmm. just stunning. I uh, broke a converted camera of, in Laos a few years ago and haven't replaced it. I had a 560 nanometer, which was color mm -hmm. and it was a you know it was fun a lot of work so if you do this high contrast black and white 830 you don't have to do channel swapping because yes you still do have to do channel swapping because it doesn't come out it comes out kind of a, a light brown and and sort of a dirty white um but you do the channel swapping in photoshop and um and it it becomes beautiful or you could just convert it in um silver effects pro you know that that's what i do most of the time i used to do the channel swapping but really i think that i get a better result out of silver effects pro i mean these are really these are winners these are stunning <laughs> i mean there are there are some <laughs> I'm just gonna go thank you nancy <laughs> i agree totally Me thank too. you very much trisha for for doing a member moment and i'll just remind anybody that if you're interested in doing one let me know so we can get you in the schedule so oh. but i have a question about the music nobody heard the music no oh, God. barely barely so, so hard bit. to get that music to, to sync with the slides and it was it, look up <laughs> William Ackerman, Floyd's Ghost. It's perfect music for that uh, light show. I heard it, but it, it was kind of intermittent. That's yeah, nice. sketchy. Yeah. Dang, I don't, well, I'll have to learn how to fix that. It, it may be trying to do it over Zoom is the issue. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure that's it. And, um, and Bill, maybe you can help me find that setting sometime. Sure. Yeah. Trisha, how yes. many of these pictures were with a tripod, because I just don't remember you using tripods. None. <laughs> wow, good job. 
Wow. Yeah, I'll after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> I can't use them. I just am. I mean, I try once in a while, but I'm just not good at it. Yeah, because the colors are real deep. You know, the black and white. And I guess it's contrast is real deep is the word for it. Mm -hmm. So did you run into a lot of playing with exposures because of having uh, blown out a lot of blown out highlights initially? No. Really? I mean, I saw some of the pictures. There were some areas like that. They were blown out. But and the camera that I've got, which is color, it's not the black and white conversion. Um, I just find it really difficult for me to get it to where like clouds aren't really blown out. They either end up to be, because it's, you know, it's got more of an orange tone music than the color one. It really turns out to be too bright. So you got to get it as bright as you can to get as much contrast and get the colors and everything right. But if you go over a little bit, because there's no, you know, they take away that one filter in the in the camera that is largely responsible for that. So I'm wondering if there's something different about the black and white. And then there's the, 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 the I am not a technical person. I, I just use these images, you know. <laughs> Steve? A lot, that's fine. Good. Steve, do you set your white balance ahead of time? Um, I was doing that and I would do an exposure and set it to the white balance. And then invariably the light would change enough to where, you know, on different subjects and stuff, it still changed it significantly. So unless I'm sitting there doing exactly the same thing at the same type of day. Um, and I, I just found I can't do it early in the morning, can't do anything, can't do anything at a, you know, middle of the day, basically. That's getting a lot of a lot of light in the image, but then you get clouds in an image, and then that really changes. I'll I'll try to. I, I bought a filter, um, a white balance filter, specifically for IR, that you basically screw on, set the white balance, take it off, and then you know go ahead and do it. Um, I'll I'll try to find it and I'll send it to you. In fact, I'll send it around to the club. Um, I just can't remember where the hell it is because we're we're doing some remodeling. But I'll <laughs> find it. <laughs> Good plan, Joel. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to send these. Okay, you guys. All right. Uh, move on. <laughs> okay. So I introduce our program. Um, <laughs> Steve Gibbs, as you most of you know, has earned his master's candidacy and is a um, qualification for um, moving up to master's. He is supposed to prepare a program for us and he has chosen to do uh, drone photography, which is something um, I know very little about. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, Steve's been in the program in our uh, club for at least since Nancy's. <laughs> Um, master's presentation, which was where it went in 2015, I guess. So that's yeah. going on eight or nine years. So um, anyway, he's a fantastic photographer, as I've seen some of his recent work. And um, so without further ado, here's Steve Gibbs. All right. Thank you. Thanks, and And uh, thank everybody. Thank you. Uh, I could get a lot of thanks to Nancy over the years. She's been a, one of my biggest fans and biggest encouragers and biggest helps and all kinds of things. So almost makes me want to tear up just thinking about the years that I've been doing this. It doesn't seem like very long, but then when talk about when you did your master's program, Nancy, I'm like, really? That was 2015? Jeez. Mm -hmm. So I guess I've been involved in this longer. Of course, I didn't compete for a good while in the beginning. Um, I just, but then I, as soon as I did start competing, I, I did well from the beginning and just kind of went pretty much straight through to, to where I'm at now when I did. But it wasn't, it wasn't something that was easy. To do. <laughs> it was something I just set a goal for myself up to this level, and then because I have so many other things that that I need to do. I'm actually at a point now to where I'm doing uh, a lot less um, 
photography and then moving into you know, other other things. And then soon, if I get actually really retired, um, then then I want to get I've got some photography things. So anyway, thanks all for, for being here and thanks everyone for and I feel very honored because there's so many amazing photographers in this club and every year we've got more and more talent in this club. It's like, I, I think, what's it going to be like, you know, five years from now? And it's just it's boggling with the technology and the, the, the quality of photography in this club. A lot of the judges, I noticed, comment on that. A lot of them are very impressed with the uh, oh, so. So we're all lucky. It's pretty good. All right, I'm going to start. I've got a PowerPoint presentation that um, has to do with drones, um, history of drone photography. I started out a, a long time ago with a, a lady named uh, Roberta Villavecchia and was part of the NASA space program and had been a pilot like stunt pilot. She was famous for things like flying planes upside down with a canopy right next to the runway and yeah. unbelievably dangerous stunts. She used to test um, uh, early scuba diving equipment and was also one of the first transsexuals. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of uh, interest there. And someone that I met girlfriend and actually was living on our property when I was up in Magic Mountain and I lost track of her. She moved out. I lost track of her for like 10 years. And then I started getting interested in drone photography. And by sheer luck, I got onto a forum and she didn't have her real name, nor did I. Um, and then discovered her. And she's the one that, that, that had some of these real early uh, Phantoms, uh, you know, basically a, a do-it-yourself kit where it had all these heavy pieces. The thing would barely fly; it would wobble around and fill images. Um, put an early GoPro on it, so you could go up in the air and see this you know, fisheye angle image, and uh, no image stabilizing. So uh, if you look at the at the video on the earlier ones, it's about making it stick to your stomach because it's just shaking all over the place in the wind. Um, but still, you're able to extract. You can either set it up to do uh, stills like 10 seconds, or you could do video, and then you can pull out images from, which is what I did early on. And I borrowed. She taught me. You know, once we got acquainted with each other and realized. We knew each other. <laughs> she was giving me, you know, without knowing who I was, was offering up assistance and offered to take me out and teach me. And then, like the day before we went to do that, uh, she said, Oh, well, then you must be Steve Gibbs. And I go, Well, then you must be Robin, <laughs> Roberta. So, anyway, it started out a uh, lot of, uh, we'd done photography in the past. I did my, had my first uh, S1 big clunky digital camera, a lot of noise, uh, but beautiful pictures, 12 megapixel digital camera was my phone. But then to get involved and start all over again with drones, technology <coughs> as it was, um, they've come an enormous distance. I mean, the, the, the older ones were heavy, the flight time was, Oh, you had you know eight minutes if you were lucky, twelve minutes. Um, now the one I have, um, it has more flight time than I need. I can get up in the air and do uh, multi-shot panoramas, like five image panoramas. I've done some that are well over a hundred shots in one image and at twenty megapixels. So that's better than my first digital digital camera with a Hasselblad. This one has a Hasselblad center in it. So I can get up there and take panoramas and fly all over the place and take multiple pictures and get in well over 20 minutes. Um, my average is, I only, I'd be like 12 minutes. So I think for most people, if you're gonna get up and wanna try one of these, um, you know, the hardest part is just learning all of the safety protocols and how to how to fly it 
but they're so simple now. The early ones, it's like if you accidentally pushed a, a stick forward that would control like forward and it tilts on its nose, sometimes it would damage the computer. Sometimes the, the props would start and the thing would would die right there and you'd have a dead drone just because of going oops with a stick. Um, nowadays, and, and that was that was when I first started, there was no screen. You didn't know what you were looking at. So you were looking at this. I did pictures, my first images of those drone pictures were of the Bodega Bay, some of them were of the Bodega Bay Church. And I was flying it up with video, just putting it on video and then flying up and then pointing different areas and looking at the sunset and looking around the buildings and all this in hopes of getting some good images um, down the road. And actually, I got quite a bit and some pretty good video that, that first time. But I did not see what was going on. Nowadays, you've got a really high contrast screen that even in pretty bright sunlight, you can see pretty good. And that's that's one of the things about the newer equipment. Not all of it. There is some out there that does not have as good a screen. I chose to use DJI equipment uh, because I'm affiliated with DJI through Roberta. Um, I, I helped her get some video that actually built rock. Uh, kind of was she's passed on now, but she was kind of a celebrity because of her aerospace. Uh, connections and all this and she was involved with a lot of the people in the DJI company so we did a promotional um, shoot out there so we uh, had somebody a videographer come out from Texas and then another person from China and we did this shoot off of off of uh, Rock and we had me acting like her friend and helping her fly when in reality I had a controller in front of me that nobody can see because the videographer that came from Texas crashed his drone directly in front of me and destroyed the computer on it. So he had no options, but the, but the Inspire one I had had two controllers and you can use one to adjust the video and take the pictures, you know, do skills and control your eye and everything. And the other one could fly the drone so he took the one that took pictures and sat hiding in my car, basically out of the way. I used it used this without looking at it and just watched the drone. And I, I had the drone about eight feet over my head and behind me. And I felt hearing it coming, not knowing if it was going to be hitting me in the back of the head. And it did a flyaway and then turned, then he took and turned the camera because it had a camera that would hurt 180 degrees. And keep in mind, this was a number of years ago. It's a big four and a half pound drone. But the camera would move uh, like 170 degrees. So you could rotate it and back and do a fade away shot, things like that. So I was flying along Goat Rock and we were taking a lot of still pictures and video. Um, and that was my, my first real doing video with a high end uh, unit, 4K video and all. So anyway, so that's about three years after I started with the early ones. We transitioned very, very quickly. We started out with, you know, jittery video, still photography, um, moderate quality images, uh, very poor flight time, uh, much more difficult to fly. Now with the one I have now that I've had for a couple of years, I can push a button on the screen and it would pick up by itself, hover in front of me. I could set down my controller and go eat a sandwich and come back and it's still hovering perfectly still in place enough that you could do like an eight second time exposure. You could actually do it. Uh, it's not legal at this point. They have now since made it legal to fly at night uh, unless you get permission with the FAA, FAA it's possible to do it. But anyway, I used to do like uh, firework shows and stuff like that with them. Um, never got any really great shots. I prefer the slow shots. The quality was better. But I've done shots flying over Santa Rosa and seeing fireworks off in the distance and that sort of thing with time exposures. So what you can do now is a far cry from what you did. But there's a lot of capacity for these drones. Um, you know, if you're into video, they're wonderful for video. 
if you want to do audio, I mean, excuse me, if you want to do, um, you know, still photography, they're absolutely perfect. And that's why I bought it. To me, it's a flying tripod. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And I would strongly encourage anyone um, at the end of, of this um, opening up, if there, anybody has, you know, questions, feel free to ask. Um, and if anybody's interested in uh, checking out and flying one of these, um, I can definitely, they can just get, get hold of me. And I'm happy to take people or a group of people out, uh, do a demonstration to see how they, how they fly. And if anybody wants to try it, I'll have like three batteries with me so I can put another battery up and we can get this thing in the air. And I can just very simple, once you get it up in the air, it's just forward, backwards, left, right. You can move it where you want and then, you know, press the button, you know, or you can control exposure and do all that. But it's quite simple actually to get some good, once, they're, once the basics are set up on them, it's quite simple to do photography with it. And if you're nervous about landing them, there's an auto land feature. So you can actually push a button and it will land because these are GPS controlled within three feet of you. So you can just sit there and watch it and go, yeah, I hear it coming, here it comes. And then you say, you know, it comes down, it slows way down and lands and shuts itself off right in front of you. So things are much easier. In the early days, it's like, oh my God, if I land this and crash it, this is like, you know, $1,000 plus. Now, you know, they're a bit more expensive, but you can buy little teeny ones now, little teeny ones that are far better and have way more features any of the older ones and much simpler to fly. So a lot going on in the drone world. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do my uh, screen share here. If I can find it here. There we go. And I'm going to start the program and I'll be, it will be talking and then I will talk at the end. Right. Here we go. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's interesting. All right. How the heck did we end up with drones? And what are they good for? Master's presentation by Steve Pierre. Here's something that I found quite interesting. Um, researching a special time report about uh, drones and history of drones. Um, there's a lot of information about it. Some of it's conflicting. Uh, but this in particular, uh, I've seen a few things about, so I guess this is something that actually happened. Um, he, a guy named Julius Neubrunner, a German apothecary, uh, he had delivery pigeons, right? So they were delivering prescription. Uh, keep in mind, this is uh, 1903. Um, so 1903, here he is delivering prescriptions. That's pretty cool, you know? But then he has the idea because he's like wondering what happened to these birds and descriptions. So then he takes and puts a camera on one of these birds and look at the size of this thing. I mean, I, I, I can't fathom with the way things were built back then how heavy this camera was. But, and the pigeon could actually fly with it. Would it fly? I, I'm just amazed at this. So anyway, he could track his roots. So he apparently was successfully using them. The birds were going to and from, um, and he got images and learned something from this. So, you know, people had a lot of specific for uh, cameras, and this was kind of interesting. I was, I was thinking to myself. <laughs> uh, he also used the birds to get photographs of the Dresden 1909 International Photographic Exhibition. Uh, so this sounds like a, a, a stunt, you know, turning them into postcards. So he's doing uh, marketing. So I wasn't clear about what else. I couldn't find anything else, else he'd be doing with that. But around the same time, uh, there was an aerial photography 
pioneer elsewhere in the world in 1903, so a little earlier than that, uh, a German engineer named Alfred Moll uh, did a put up a gun power powered rocket that reached 2,600 feet. So this took about eight seconds, and it it uh, put out a parachute equipped camera that made photos on its descent. So rockets, birds. Um, there were also uh, <coughs> that were going up. So pretty much anything you can imagine that someone could get up in the air, um, people had been wanting to do uh, some form of photography from the air for a long time and for many different reasons. So this, as written on the slide, uh, this is something is in many places on the internet. Uh, this one, it says on the side, taken October 13th, 60, and uh, the person who took its name is James Wallace Black. Uh, that seems to be uh, showing up in a number of places on the internet. Um, what I found interesting about this is, for one, uh, there's a contradiction in the date. There's another date since October 8th, so hard to say what's actually right, but I'm guessing what's on this is. Um, but the reality is, uh, apparently, balloons were created around in the United States around like 1790. Uh, so that's where they were, they were bringing people up in the air. Hardly anybody had used them uh, or were brave enough to do it. Uh, so, and here it is, photography is awful damn early. So. When you're talking about how you're going to do photographing something like this, keep in mind that 20 minutes is was the time frame you had when you had to develop it. So you can imagine trying to get up in the air with a film plate. How long is that going to take to get up in the air with a with it and then get it back down and then develop it? Doesn't seem real practical, you know. So uh, there was even in 1858, there was a, a Frenchman took all of its gear, dark room, water supply, a basket, everything, and managed to produce uh, an image, uh, but you know, that one was lost. Um, so this was finally done. This James Wallace Black finally did it here in Boston. So it's not an easy thing. You know, I think about what I could do to throw a drone up in the air and in a few minutes, I can throw it up in the air, bring it down, and I have an image I can download onto a computer. Um, back then, uh, it was quite a quite a process, and as I do this, I find quite quite interesting. So here is an example of one of the images that came out of one of these cameras that was strapped to pigeon. Kind of a little dizzying looking at it. But you get the idea of the detail and imagine what that would be like to have this pigeon come back and then to go develop this and then look at this and say, oh, that's where these things are going. You know? So I'm sure it was very helpful, although quite a bit tedious. So this image is San Francisco. And you see a little smoke in the foreground here from a building. Uh, this is right after the 1906 earthquake. So this is something that <clears throat> was done by George Lawrence. And it was using uh, 2,000 feet above uh, the city from a balloon. He was able to get a balloon up in the air and take this image right after the earthquake. And there were a lot of reasons for people to be excited around this time. Um, when it came to one, uh, the military was seeing these images and they were automatically thinking, wow, if we can get up in the sky and start taking pictures of battlefronts, um, we can get reconnaissance information. So the uh, you know the military started looking into this and did all kinds of research. So there's all kinds of ways that it's been used that 
we never really knew anything about until much, much later. This is one that everybody's heard about. Everybody knows about the San Francisco earthquake. Um, I did not know that there was a balloon, or actually more than one, but a balloon photograph of this from that time. And I think it's wonderful that we've had this type of documentation over history. So keeping in mind that, uh, you know, the flight that the Wright brothers did in 1903, with, uh, you know, man-powered aircraft, that's when things really started getting interesting. And then you know, images like this were, were possible. Um, but the, the first one, I don't have a, find anything on it, but a guy named L.P. Bunvillian took a photograph and actually in 1908. So... 1903 to 1908 and already starting to take images from a powered, you know, man-powered airplane. Um, and that was, he was over Le Mans, France. So that wasn't the United States here, but guess who piloted? That was Wilbur Wright. So the United States was actually involved in that, you know, was in France. Um, this image was around you know, we're talking in the, in the 40s. And there's a lady there, it was actually a life photographer, Margaret Burke White, uh, first woman to fly with a combat, combat crew, uh, or and soiled it in the last. So it's a brave woman and some wonderful photographs. You know, this is one showing a passenger plane. So this is in 1943, so it's quite a bit later than that, but excellent quality. So when they started really getting to the skies with these, a lot of these old photographs uh, in the 40s were really good quality, really amazingly good quality. So I was uh, quite surprised to find something of this quality that, that early, but in the uh, wartime efforts, the United States was using them, um, and they actually had a drone, uh, it's called a uh, TDR-1. TDR-1 was not for photography. This was an attack drone. So not only were they doing aerial photography, you know, look to see what was going on behind enemy lines and see how troops and supplies were moving, but they were actually building drones really, that were used to uh, attack uh, already. So the, the figure of drones uh, is, is something that started early. I mean, you think about the Nazis and what they were doing, you know, uh, in England. Uh, you know, they were scaring the hell out of people because of missiles. And then there were also drones that were happening too in the 40s. So stuff from the skies is not always going to be pleasant. But um, thank God we have photography and a good use for it. And that battle does continue to this day where people still think about drones as something that flies over and looks in people's windows and attacks and kills people, largely thanks to the United States use of drones. Um, so I've been involved for a lot of years in educating people in different areas about drones. And uh, whenever I take drones out, I get questions. And some people come up and confront me. Some people get really angry when they see it up in the air. And uh, they, they don't realize that these things have a super wide angle camera and everything looks really small unless you get pretty damn close with one. So if you see a drone that's a hundred feet away from your house, they really, you look really, really small on them. So they're not really, detail. Um, and of course, we all know that the technology is available. Images can zoom in, you know, the government has stuff like that, but commercial drones that when I could go by uh, we do not have that potential. So there are a lot of unfounded fears on drones. And in this day and age, drones can be used for, you know, dealing with crops, um, looking for plants, that are dying, uh, checking out the water status over vineyards. Um, they can use the, the drones to do things like uh, infrared photography, 
looking for uh, an individual that is uh, out in the woods, for example, looking for heat signatures. Uh, they're used for looking at buildings to see the water link, uh, or even uh, I've used them for areas where there is heat seeping out of a house, look as far as insulating. I've actually flown drones for that type of purpose for, for the company for a while. A uh, friend of mine owned a company like that. Anyway, lots of good. So here we are, modern drones. Um, these following images. Uh, were taken with a Mavic Pro 2. And this particular one was done uh, at Big Dune, not far from um, Death Valley. And you know, it's an early morning image. Um, one thing I really love about being able to get up early in the morning like this is to see the shadows from up above and to see the detail that you get. Uh, I've had times when I'll put my drone up in the air and fly around for a good while. Uh, in this case, if you look way off to the right, you can see there's people already walking around way off in the distance here. So there's actually quite a bit going on here. Um, but what you notice is that um, there are times when I'll get up in the air and I'll realize that the lighting is too harsh. Or I'll look at it and I'll go, yeah, there's a better vantage place. Um, and then I'll take the drone in and move it to a new place. So sometimes I spend quite a bit of time looking around. In this image, it's main, the main idea is just to show what you get in terms of shadows visible from the sky, you know, from the ground. It's so completely different. So this really is a, a wonderful use for drones. Um, and a little bit more about the history of drones. So we just saw some, some uh, you know, the history of drones, where they come from. Um, a little bit more about the history. Uh, my history in particular started uh, oh, about eight years ago. And uh, a lady named uh, Roberta Villavecchia was on a, a website and of course, you know, online they have all these forums, and I was looking into drones being into photography and wondering about how to do it and what to buy if I was going to buy one. Uh, how, to learn how to do it? I didn't have a lot of information about them, um, and as it turned out, uh, this person who had a, a handle called Fizz which I didn't know what the hell that meant, but we were typing back and forth and communicating for a period of weeks about a drone. And the person was quite helpful. And uh, I'm finding out that this is someone who has an extra drone. So they told me, well, gee, you know, it sounds like you live not far from where I'm at. And then I said, yeah, I don't have anyone to do guitar for you. And um, as it turns out, I started telling my story. I said, yeah, I had a person that I used to go to do guitar for you. And um, they actually did like remote control uh, submarines and that sort of thing in the building models. And I know they were also uh, into early, early drones. Well, come to find out, I had not seen this person in 10 years. Come to find out that's the same person. So my uh, friend who had been living on my property, who was a relative of my girlfriend at the time, uh, being helpful. And we didn't know who each other was for quite some time. Friendship, and she had worked for NASA. So, in uh, dealing with NASA, she was part of the space mission. And so, she'd always had an interest in getting up in the skies and 
also photography. And after being older uh, and finding out um, wasn't going to be pilot anymore, she would actually been stuck pilot driving with the canopy of the plane upside down within like you know a foot or two of the of the, of the tarmac. Um, They've done a lot of different things, uh, but she decided that aerial photography would be a really good uh, thing to do. And then she started learning from some people who are actually in NASA and were photographers, um, one of which now does photography for uh, or did aerial photography all around the world and they were they were had been friends and had actually worked together so uh here i am learning about the history from someone who is you know, somewhat involved in it and uh so he had a lot of different resources and so i i went over to i had seen her for 10 years and then she showed me this uh, or you know, um, DJI Phantom and uh, the, the early Phantoms had um, earlier GoPros strapped to the, the bottom of it. and so her she had a couple of them but this first one which is the one that I would to practice on had a camera strapped on the bottom of it and it was not uh, it had a gimbal but it was not a gimbal that was that image stabilizing. So the first flights that I did, we took it up in the air. Um, all you could do is look at it in the air and fly it around and know that it was taking video. So you would manually press a button on the camera and get it recording. And after it was done um, flying, when you brought it down, then you could put it in and take out a card and put it into a laptop and look at it and then see, oh, gee, that's that's what the photographs I did look like. Um, and so we started out early on taking those images and using software to pull individual images out of video. Um, later on, I got a DJI um, drone, which was far higher end than that. Uh, it was an Inspire One. And she and I went to see a guy named Barry Blanchard. And Barry Blanchard was a, an individual who tested drones. So um, a lot of these drones, there are people in California and all over the place that take them up in the air and test them and shake out the bugs in so so there are you know in china they're building these things and then they have representatives here in the united states professional photographers all over the place that are using them and then they send them uh, a new drone and say hey bring it out tell us what's wrong with it. what can we improve so they kind of in secret fly these things around <laughs> and uh, say, oh crap, I just crashed it into the ground. Well, this is wrong or that's wrong, you know, or they find little minor bugs and, and help uh, improve these and make them safer for you or I to be able to utilize them. So uh, anyway, that was my first uh, exposure to these. And I got to meet Barry Blanchard. Um, and when I went from the early Phantom One, where I learned this, you know, unstable flight flying it around. Then the next one I got was a Phantom Two, and that one actually I was able to put a, a camera and it had a stabilizing platform on it, so it could fly. I think that one was about eight minutes. Could fly up. It could do video. It was pretty high quality video, and you actually could use a, uh, um, a controller that would give you a nice stable image and good control over it, you know, start it and stop it. Um, you could start to stop the, the camera on it. Um, 
And then, you know, the next step up from that was going to an Inspire One. So keep in mind up until this point, what I was doing was taking images off of video. Um, the other thing about the uh, Phantom 2 with the GoPro is the, the newer one with the Phantom 2, you are able to set the GoPro to take images like every 10 seconds, for example. So you'd go up and you'd point at a certain area and go, yeah, it looks like it's about here. And you'd let it sit there and take a few shots and then you'd move it somewhere else. You bring it down and you're never quite sure how many images you got or what they look like till you got them, got them down. But at least you had uh, a number of images and they were higher quality still images than what I was getting from the video. So that was, um, you know, the next step from the video, even though we're talking 4K video, uh, it was a big step getting up, getting up to actually having real uh, still images off of the GoPro cameras. So the, that was a big, big improvement. Um, the next step from that was to go with the Inspire One. And the Inspire One, um, when I met Barry Blanchard, you drove up from uh, Santa Cruz and he drove up here to uh, our area, actually in Petaluma, to an airfield we had here that were these uh, remote control models, primarily a uh, few drones, although they kind of didn't like the drones. They were like kind of blocking their way, so to speak. They didn't like giving up their time to the drones, um, but we would take drones up and kind of put them off the side and say, hey, you know, go ahead and fly over there, no problem. So it was really not a, not a problem. They had made it a problem. <laughs> So in any case, um, uh, he showed me this Inspire One and the Inspire One actually had landing gear that retracted. So you take this thing up in the air and keep in mind, this thing is four and a half pounds. So it's, it's, it's something significant up in the air. It's not a little, you know, one pound or like the one I have now is smaller. It's two and a half pounds, the Mavic Pro, Pro 2. But that was a four and a half pound drone. So safety is definitely an issue. If that one dropped on somebody, uh, you know, somebody could be hurt significantly from that. Um, I saw one come out of the sky uh, early on when the software was not as well developed and uh, came down and went through a guy's glass table and just smashed the hell out of the table. And believe it or not, the drone had one cracked landing gear, but everything, the camera, everything still worked on it. Um, I had one myself, um, the one that I personally owned, that, that actually lost a signal and flew into a tower. It was a, it was a hidden tower up in the trees, uh, cell tower, and it lost control. Um, you know, nowadays they have much better electronics, but at that point, you're talking, that was only a matter of just a matter of a few years ago. Um, the earlier ones you'd get up in the air and occasionally you'd have one that would do a flyaway. So you'd have one that just kept going. And I know friends that lost them out, and dunked them in the ocean. Um, I had one that flew down the, the river in the Russian river. And uh, I had no control over it at all. And I watched it hit a power line and it ripped the camera off it and it fell into, into the river right near steelhead fishing and scared the living crap out of the poor guy. And he got all hostile with me saying, oh, you those things are so dangerous and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, it did not hit him. It was about, but it was about 20 feet away from him. So it was a big wake up call to me, uh, even though I was, 300 yards away with it when it lost that control. But I realized I did not want to take it near people. And that told me I do not want to drive, you know, take drones and fly them in a, you know, a town or in a park or anywhere where there's anybody even nearby. So my photography since that time has been, you know, go out on the coast or take it places where there, I can't find anybody around. There's nobody around. And I haven't had any issues uh, since then. I haven't had flyaways. Um, I had a couple, couple of situations where I couldn't see on the camera, um, but I had uh, on the remote controller, you have a little, uh, diagram like an arrow and you can look at that and go okay well the drone is pointing that way and that shows you where it took off from and you can turn it around and bring it back so even without having the camera view of seeing what the camera is seeing 
I was actually able to fly it back to me. So uh, in any case, nowadays, uh, with the, starting with the Inspire 1 that I had, um, you could, uh, and there were other drones, a number of other drones at that point, you could actually put one up in the air, you can do panoramas, you can stitch panoramas together, um, you can put full size cameras up, uh, big, you know, Canon cameras or Nikon cameras, for example, and program them to fly patterns. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you could utilize um, the, the, the images and you can control the exposure. You can control, you can do time exposures. Um, I've taken firework shots at night with them. Um, there's a lot of image image uses for them. I'm not showing any of those uh, images here. Most of them are pretty old images that, that I've done. Um, but I will we'll show you a few more images here that give you an idea of what can be done with the uh, Inspire and Mavic and most of the common, uh, common, uh, you know, avail commonly available drones in these days. On a Death Valley trip, we stopped and I could see these, like a wagon train of, of RVs off in the distance across the desert. And uh, at first light, um, I flew around for a good 15, 20 minutes and I was looking at the mountains, I was looking at the clouds, that was my first thing that attracted my attention. And then I just flew all over trying to see what could I get in the foreground? That's one advantage of having a drone is instead of hiking all over the place, you can fly it, you know, long distance, uh, like a mile or more. Um, I mean, you're supposed to keep it in line of sight. So it's, it's not technically legal without a spotter to fly for very long distances, but you can, I fly it up and look all over the place right nearby where I'm at and try and decide where is a good perspective. Um, do I have some leading lines? Uh, so in this case, I love the, the idea of the desert and there's a little hole like a fire pit here kind of in the center down low uh, and the, um, you know, the RVs and the mountains and of course the clouds really made for a special shot for me. Uh, heading up towards Lake Sonoma from Healdsburg, uh, I spent some time flying around near one of the vineyards looking at the mountains and the clouds and I put my camera straight down which is one advantage of having a drone is you can you can go easily straight down or left or right turn and look in every 360 degree direction. In this case, I was just looking at the lines on the vineyards, which is something you don't see from the ground. And so I took an image and decided to make a little artsy project out of this one. This is Fort Ross, and it was taken in 2019 uh, after the fires. So very, very smoky, orange glow, uh, kind of, creepy looking as I'm sure all of us remember. Um, around the late 1800s, there had been balloons, kites, um, and rockets even used to carry cameras up to take pictures of natural disasters. Um, one notable one was done in uh, the 1906 uh, earthquake. And that one was probably one of the more famous ones done with 17 kites connected together with a curved plate, which I find quite fascinating. That must have been quite a project. You can imagine taking an exposure and then having to bring all 17 of these kites down to change a plate and then try and hope you had enough wind to get it up and the wind didn't change direction. And I just, I can't imagine how difficult that must have been. Yes, this is Goat Rock at sunrise. I'm sure many of us would recognize that uh, parking lot on the, on the rock, but most of us have not seen the top of it. So that is one advantage of having a drone is being able to fly up, look at perspectives. Uh, I actually took perspectives, flew all the way around this rock and looked at all the faces of it and took pictures of this first. Um, and just explored it. And it was quite interesting to see from different perspectives. Um, one thing that uh, I love to do 
is to watch the lighting um, and get up and then look at what the lighting looks like at different heights. So that's one thing, you, you know, with the tripod, you know, you can set the tripod up and you look there and you wait for the sun to do what it's going to do. But in a situation like this, if you're looking, for example, out towards the sunrise and you fly up, you can actually kind of make it like earlier in time and fly up and say, oh, here's the sun. And then you can fly down and make the sun go down a little bit lower behind the mountains. So you, you have a certain amount of control that you don't have uh, on the ground with a camera. This sunrise image was taken near High School Road, which you can see a little bit up to the right-hand side, the upper right of the image. Um, so Laguna de Santa Rosa uh, near High School Road and uh, sunrise. It's an image that I saw the fog and I knew I wanted to have the fog in. Um, I got up at sunrise and I hovered there for quite a while watching the light and deciding I really wanted to get the light on the trees uh, that you could see this yellow color in the trees were really beautiful and I love the leading line and just decided really needed more light and the trees create some shadow so a lot of times uh, you know we'd be sitting there in a tripod on the ground um, in this case I can go up and down and you know look around but I can also just decide what I think my best composition is and anticipate the lighting um, at, at elevation and then point the camera down a little bit. Uh, in this case, it was actually a five image vertical panorama. So I pointed, I got the sky up higher and then all the way down, which enables me to have a much larger image with more detail. Um, and then I can also crop it and do other things with it as well. But, you know, this was staying in one spot for a long time. I was probably there in excess of 20 minutes, uh, nervously looking at my battery levels until there was enough light uh, to get exactly what I wanted. Uh, this image uh, started out with flying over the rocks and looking at the waves and looking at the clouds and I really liked the shape of the clouds and the detail in the clouds. So I was trying to imagine something that would go well with it. And as I waited uh, to see the sun start to go down and getting a little bit better color, I noticed the edges of the cliff line and how starting to get some color on that. And I really liked the shapes that um, kind of mimicked the clouds somewhat, but you had kind of a leading line there heading off towards the clouds and this interesting detail there. So this was done as another vertical panorama. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. And uh, I think it turned out um, pretty well. This is something that I like to be able to do. And that's just to get my drone up and explore an area. This is an old abandoned house that's uh, not visible but I was driving north of Bodega and I saw something that looked like it could have been an old farm and I put my drone up in the air and flew and saw it and it's there's you know no evidence of anyone being here for a long time so it made for an interesting shot. This image is the back of a sea cave and it's located north of Jenner a little bit. Um, just before you get to Russian Gulch, there's a cliff. And I piped down that. I used to sit at the edge of this cliff and listen to this deep bass note and see this spray firing out of this cave. But you can't look in the cave. Uh, you can't get to it. There's no access to it. Um, all you can look is see birds nesting on the cliff next to it. And you know there's something there, but I have no way to find out. So one day I brought my Inspire, my DJI Inspire, and flew it up there. And uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, they do, the drones do give you the advantage of being able to hover pretty, um, you know, pretty stable. Um, but the disadvantage is that in this case, when the waves are to the back, wind and sea spray would come out. So it was very dangerous to do. 
because I could have easily gotten blown back against a cliff or got enough sea spray to have shorted out electronics or damaged it. So I had to wait until the waves had calmed down and watched sets for a long time nervously. My hands were shaking doing the shot. But anyway, drones give you the capacity to fly like out to the ocean, fly down close to rocks and up over the top of rocks and things like that that are can be pretty exciting that you really have no other way to see. This is a cove up in Salt Point State Park. And I was actually on the opposite side of the cove. It was a pretty wide area, uh, foggy morning, pretty long distance. And looking at it from a telephoto, you couldn't get a clear shot. There's too much fog. So I put my drone up in the air and flew all the way across to the other side of the cove. And basically uh, checked it out up and down. I tried shots from down low, from up above. I did panoramas. So I've spent quite a bit of time. I just thought these rocks were fascinating. It was a difficult shot to try and separate these rocks out from the background. It was just kind of a mess. So I took a lot of pictures down low with the waves and finally decided on, on this one. But again, this is not an image that would have worked well just standing on the bank of the telephoto I had to fly close enough so that I could, you know, not have too much uh, fog or, or sea spray in between me and the, and the rocks and to get a good clean shot. Speaking of flying a drone, this is the display on the Mavic Pro 2. And you can take a look at here. I'll tell you a few things about what you're seeing here. Uh, on the upper left, it shows it in yellow. It says ready to go vision. Um, so it's not green. If that little bar there was green versus yellow, it means you have full GPS capability. So you can just hands off and uh, you put your controller down and walk away and it's still going to hover exactly where you left it. Um, so it, it enables you to stay in position in the sky and to keep track of all of your, you know, your location. Uh, the bottom left there, it actually shows a map you can click on and you can see a little arrow, which is your drone. So like, for example, if it was in the sun and you lose track of it, you can't see it, you can look at that arrow, take it and uh, point it back towards you because it'll see me on the map, it'll show you and it'll show the drone and the line that it took. So it'll be like drawing a line of where you just flew to and you can follow that line right back and then put it down or also on the left about the middle of the screen, you'll see an arrow pointing to an H and that's the return to home. So you can have it uh, return to home on its own. Uh, which you can actually override. You can automatically take off right above that. You'll see that uh, in the upper right in green, you'll see it says 47%. And that is actually your battery. So you can click on that. You can look at the individual charges of each battery um, just to make sure your batteries are in good shape. You don't you want to make sure that you don't have a battery that looks substantially lower than the others because it would indicate a problem with, within one of the cells of that battery. So it's all good things to take a look at. Uh, in this case, if you look about the middle of the screen at the top, um, you can see the uh, GPS uh, where it says position. On the, just to the right of that, it shows that it has six satellites. So you can click on that and you can see how many satellites it's using uh, to see how good a signal you have. Uh, the older ones, you were lucky to have one or two or three, and now it's a lot more, a lot more sensitive. Uh, and below that, you, know, you can see the ISO 100, uh, the shutter speed. Um, you can see your uh, raw, camera raw setting. Uh, in my case, it says slow SD card. Uh, because I'm using an older card, so it does not record as fast. It would not be good for video, for example. Uh, let's see. Oh, on the right, uh, about the middle, you'll see a yellow display there where I'm actually taking five images, and it'll take five images of various exposures to be set to three or five, which I do because if you're taking a picture 
and you're doing like a vertical panorama, it might be darker down below and lighter in the top. So you might have to go in and play with images or you might have to do an HDR image to get the exposure you want, but it helps to get a lot more images. You may never fly. You may have one of the best things you've ever seen. And it really helps to have multiple exposures as many people are aware of. <laughs> um, let's see, oh, down the lower right is a little play button. And if your drone is on the ground, for example, and you want to take a look, if you did some video footage, it will actually record some video on it that you can take a look at, as well as on the SD card. Uh, there's a lot of information that's available on this on the screen, uh, and everything that you click on, there is more information. So there's a lot there. They're very safe to fly, very easy to fly. Uh, it takes a while to learn, but basically throwing it up in the air and taking a picture is very, very simple. So they are easy to do basics and you can learn more advanced stuff as you go. Well, the last time I turned on my controller for my DJI uh, Mavic 2 Pro, um, I looked and it came up with this uh, database update and then I clicked on it. Uh, it explained that it was updating geofencing system. So these are uh, basically you're connected to GPS and these keep updated. Their software or firmware keeps updated. Um, these are updates that are done as new information comes up. So as you're flying, uh, it knows where you're at and it's actually you know, sending that information out. So if you're flying near an airport, for example, it will give you something that comes up when you're getting ready to take off and it'll tell you, nope, you're in areas you can't fly in. So it'll give you a warning. Uh, and you do wanna learn the um, all of the uh, areas that you can and can't fly in the situations. There are some simple tests and rules and I'll give information more on that later. This is the Mavic 2 Pro by DJI. And it's the one that I use. It's a 24 megapixel Hasselblad made camera on it. It's a pretty decent camera, although there's a little bit of noise. So I find pretty much every image I do, I have to use a slight amount of noise reduction on it. I've never had an explanation why other people don't seem to be complaining about it. But uh, in any case, that's something I live with on it, but the images are pretty darn good. Uh, they're great for doing panoramas. They're great for doing still and 4K video, uh, 1080 video. They're fantastic for extremely stable. Uh, you, you can fly at pretty relatively high speed. I think it's about 22 miles an hour is the fastest. They are programmed and slowed down. Initially, they would go faster than this, and they slow them down for better battery times, for example, and safety. So this is a warning and in red there, you'll see obstacle avoidance disabled. And what that means is in this case, the light was too low so that when I had this sitting down, um, just in my case, in the floor of the house, basically, there are lights that will, lights and cameras that will look around to see if there is an obstacle that either in front or behind you. This is a fairly new feature for these. And if you look at below that, it says enable forward and backward obstacle sensing. This is really, really an awesome feature because there's a lot of settings on it that will allow you to um, enter advanced settings and make changes to it. But basically it makes it so that if you're flying near a tree, for example, uh, or you know anything that's fairly close to it, it'll stop right where it's at and it will give you a notification about it. So it's really cool, really wonderful feature to have. And for those of you who like to do video, uh, there are people that I know who will do uh, live presentations, like they'll be up in the morning saying, hey, here's sunrise taken from such and such, and they'll put that on Facebook, uh, do YouTube videos. So you can do videos. Um, it shows there's a map. You can see Highway 116 on there, and that's wonderful for you know positioning yourself and seeing where you're at. Any, in any case, 
it's something I have not done. I don't prefer to do any uh, video at this point. It just takes too much memory up for me. But anyway, it's a pretty cool feature for those who are into it. Uh, the Mavic 2 has a pretty complex system for navigation in it. Uh, most of these units have a internal compass, which needs to be calibrated, and they will give you warnings if it seems like there's a problem. Um, you need to do it when it's away from metal, for example. You wouldn't do it in a, over some concrete that might have steel in it or near a metal building or directly, you know, right near your car. Um, you want to keep it basically out over some dirt somewhere, for example, is ideally. Um, the IMU is basically the uh, computer and the brain of it, and that does need to be calibrated if there's something like if it, had, if it takes a hit somewhere or there's some sort of uh, issue comes up with a uh, software, the IMU uh, might need to be recalibrated, for example. Uh, this just shows you like the accelerometer, uh, gyroscope settings on it. And for the most part, there's not, nothing that you have to worry about. Um, but in the blue down below towards the bottom there, you'll see IMU calibration. If you need to do it, um, you know, it's a quick, easy way to do it. It takes a few minutes to do. Um, I've only had to do it once on this unit. I had to do it quite frequently, actually, on my, my previous one. But it does give you signals. There's a lot of information that's very helpful to keep these safe. So that's all you really need to know. Uh, primarily is that uh, you just kind of need to know where you can take a quick peek at it and know that it will give you warnings. If there's an, an issue coming up, uh, it typically will not allow you to fly. This is something that I try and check every time I fly up on the upper right on the display. Um, it shows the little battery and when you click on it, this is what you see. So you notice the little green squares there show the battery voltages. And in this case, you've got only within like two tenths of a volt, 380, 381, 382. So they're very close. That's normal readings. If you looked at one that said like 3.5 or 3.6, something like that, uh, it might be time to replace a battery. They can get swollen. Um, I have had one that I had to uh, get rid of because it was swollen and in, in risk of exploding. So you have to keep an eye on your batteries, uh, be careful charging them. They do automatically discharge. If you've had them in charged for a matter of days, the default is I believe it's a week, and then they'll slowly de discharge down to about maybe half or thereabouts. Uh, it looks like more than that, but if you put the, put the drone up in the air, you won't have a lot of flying time in that. So you could fly them uh, when they're in that mode, but just be aware that you won't have a terribly long uh, flight. Um, you notice also it says smart return home, which is turned on in green. The aircraft will return home when remaining battery is only enough for a return to home, RTH. And below that it says low battery warning, which is 20%. So when it gets down to there, at 20%, that's what the setting I have set for it. Some people go higher than that. Um, it will uh, return to home. And the one really amazing thing about these is they will calculate according to where it at. So if, if you're you know, half a mile away, for example, it's gonna come back a lot sooner than it would if you were 100 yards away. So it actually count, accounts for your distance uh, away and they're very accurate. I don't know of anyone having a problem with, with that in particular. Um, this also shows the flight time, you know, how many minutes um, and you can turn on the voltage or off the voltage on the main screen if you, if you want. Uh, I basically, as long as I've got the access to the batteries on there, I'll usually click on it so I can see the individual batteries and then I just kind of take a general peek at it as I'm flying just to see how much time you know, I've got left to fly, basically. All right, and and we're back. Wow. So I apologize for the redundancy on there. When I got into the history of my brand, I had two versions of this, and one of them, I deleted all that from it. And I added some new 
photographs. And I guess I didn't re rename it differently because I thought this was the most current one and it wasn't. So, <laughs> oh, well. so you have to listen to me blather on about the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm a little embarrassed. But anyway, hopefully you've got some little more uh, information about these and uh, hopefully it was enjoyable. Um, has anybody got any questions about these? Yeah, Pat? I have a question. Yeah. Um, your your drone weighs more than the FAA limit of what 250 grams, which means you have to register it every time before you fly it, right? Well, not every time before you fly it. Um, and keep in mind that I have. I don't know. I'm looking at their their site, and and it seems like they're encouraging you to to register anything over 250 grams. Well, so what are the rules? Red, yeah, but that does not mean every time you fly it. That's and I have a, a new uh, a new thing that just mm -hmm. so what they've been doing, like if you're near an airport, for example, um, you you have to get hold of the airport, you have to get authorization. So the rules are constantly changing. So every time I get ready to fly it, um, I you know if it's not going to be in any place near people, especially, I got to go I go check all the check all the rules. But, yeah, I was like, it, apparently you're under Part 107, and um, right. and, and it seems like that's way more complicated than just recreational uh, flying because you weigh more. It, it weigh your yours weighs more than, and yours is also not available anymore. You can't buy it unless you buy about, it used. You're talking the, about the the the, the two. Your, your, the drone that you were talking about, your drone. Right. Yeah. They, and it's the same. It's just an updated version of the same thing. So you, well, they have some that are lighter than 250 grams, too. And I'm just curious yes. if you um, if you have to. I don't know. You're saying you don't have to register it each time. But well, you, you uh, have. I would want to check that. However, can you is it worth getting one lighter? Yes. I mean, just yeah. making sure you're under 250 grams and do they work? Yes. And what's happened in the last year or two is now because of the change in the rules, um, they've, they've come up with ones that are well below that. that are really small, like mm -hmm. your, your hand, you know, like that big. And those drones Actually, some of them now will be able to do, I believe now they're able to do 4K. So you can do all kinds of different uh, sizes uh, from smaller than the palm of your hand, like micro, that still will do quite good pictures. You know, keep in mind that the sensor is smaller and the camera is smaller, but they're still very stable. They've got long, long flight times. So... Uh, DJI especially has come up with some ones now that are much smaller than the one um, that I have. And I actually haven't flown mine for, flown mine for a while because they came up with the new registration rules. And with the new rules, it's made it so that it's it's a lot more difficult for for with my size of drone to, to do all the registration. And I have to take another training. Mm. I just yeah, that's it. what I was reading. I was reading that you have to take a, a remote pilot. You have to earn a remote pilot certificate. <laughs> right. right. And that, that used to be reserved for the larger, larger drones. But now they've moved that down and they've changed and added all kinds of other safety things, which is good in terms of kind of weeding down. But it does make it more difficult for the ones that are like, like you said, Avid Pro, um, anything from that size and larger. Uh, and then, then there's the, you know, 55 pound ones, because I, I have friends, Barry Blanchard, who I was mentioning, um, he flies a, uh, a UAV 1000, which is about 40 pounds, plus a camera, plus interchangeable lenses. So when he puts that thing up in the air, he's got an almost $50,000 worth of electronics up in the air. And he has to be, he has, it's basically like getting a pilot's license, mm -hmm. uh, almost the same type of testing to fly the, the larger ones like that. So there are different levels. I've heard you can't uh, insure them either, right? 
<laughs> so uh, if they land in a tree, you're going to have to go up and get it. <laughs> that, it depends. Um, <laughs> there have been some companies, and I don't, I haven't checked into that for a while, but uh, there was a company that was offering to do that. And I, my guess is like most insurance companies, that may become either impossible or prohibitively expensive. Um, when I looked into it, it was possibility. But since I wasn't really doing much in the way of commercial work, I was like, why bother? I, I did uh, get mine, my Inspire. I got in a redwood tree um, right near the bridge here. I was flying over the river at sunset and it came and did a return home with a software that went buggy. And it was supposed to stay up at 120 feet and you can set it. So when, when the one gets ready to return to home, you can program it for where you're flying. And if it's if there's nothing around you, no trees around you, you could set it for 20 feet and have it return to home at that level. So it flies up from where you were flying it to that level or down, depending on how high you're flying. And then it comes back at whatever level it's programmed for. And in my case, I was manually landing this thing and it was almost on the ground. And then it decided to do a return to home. And then it started flying back where I had taken it off on the, on the bridge, but it didn't fly up to the return to height. It just went up to about 40 feet and flew straight into a tree. Actually, it was more than that. It was about 80 feet and flew into a tree. So I had to get out my rock climbing gear and a ladder and go climb up there and play rescue. I couldn't even find anybody to help with it. So anyway, yeah, occasionally something like that does happen. Um, and insurance is, is nice. But um, there's another thing that I didn't talk about. Uh, and I have a little, it's like, a, I don't know if you've seen pet trackers, where you have a little device that you can put on your dog, for example. And there is a company, there's a couple companies out there now, probably more than that now, that you can put uh, Velcro, a little tracking tag on the side of it. And then you've got a little small device that has a little arrow on it and it will point to where the drone is. And I had the, the time that I had mine lost control and flew into a cell phone tower. Um, it, it actually flew into this tower, broke one of the wings and the camera flew off and hit the ground but the tracker was still fine. And I was able after dark to go, I went over this fence and started walking across this, some farmer's property, I assume, I don't know whose, whose it was, but I snuck over the fence and started following it. And I, it was over a mile that I'd walked and hiked and following an arrow. And then it went right. And then I found out it was inside a uh, a chain link fence that had the barbed wire that went outwards. So you're not supposed, you know, supposed to keep people from climbing over. So to get my drone back, I had to climb up and over the barbed wire and go in and then take the drone and hang it on the top and then climb outside. <laughs> but that tracker came in handy. It saved me 2,800 bucks at that point. And I was able to get the, get the drone and take it out and do a uh, repair on it and just replace the propeller and uh, re-put all the plugs. I'll say that they're really amazingly sturdy. Um, I've had a, a couple of crashes with the Inspire, which is, you know, that was four and a half pounds. That's a pretty heavy unit. I mean, imagine, you know, something that weighs five pounds flying in the air. That's substantial amount of weight. So they can do a lot of damage to themselves pretty easily. But I had that thing hit a tree uh, more than once um, and then, you know, hit the ground at pretty high elevation and then have still be able to repair it. <laughs> Luckily, not to be, I, I kind of worry about birds. Have you had any interaction with them? Um, the thing about birds is they kind of consider this like another raptor and they pretty much steer clear. They, if they see them, the one problem, and this is why I avoid the coast a lot of times, if there's birds nesting, seagulls will get very territorial and they will come and try to attack it. So, <laughs> you know, they, I've literally had areas where there was no seagulls at all. And I'll be flying out, trying to take a photograph. And then all of a sudden I look and I go, oh, crap, seagull just flew by and he dive bomb it. 
So then I have to full speed turn around and get out of there before they knock it out of the sky because they can't. Anyway, Tricia, you have a question. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, first, is it D G like gypsy or D J like justice? J. J? Okay. Yeah. And um, my sense from what you've said is that they're around twenty eight hundred dollars. Is that right? It depends on the options. Uh -huh. and that's that's a good ballpark uh, figure. You can get ones that are pretty decent quality for under a thousand dollars now. Uh -huh. So it is definitely possible to to buy one that's pretty good. And I usually suggest to people that to start with something that's lower end to begin with to learn mm -hmm. and then see if it's adequate. And then, you know, it's not too hard to put them on eBay and, and resell them. But keep in mind, you lose your a, a lot of money in trying to resell one of these. So you know, if you got one that's several thousand dollars and you decide you want the next one next year, you're probably going to lose 1500 bucks or, or so on it trying to resell it because the technology changes so rapidly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Nancy. I have two short disparate questions. One is how did the pigeon trip the shutter? And the <laughs> other is could, could you could you take those shots in Death Valley now? The shots in Death Valley. Um, well, I wasn't in Death Valley, so I, you cannot shoot in Death Valley, and I was not in Death Valley at all doing any aerial photography at all. And I did see people with the small mini Mavics that were flying there, and I had to go inform them, say, you know, you really shouldn't have this up in the air. You're not have, supposed to have them uh, in state parks. You're not supposed to have them, especially Death Valley is a big no-no. Um, and I did try and get permission and I was not granted permission, so I did not fly there. Oh, when you said Big Dune, it's Big Dune State P Park. Right. Oh, I got it. Okay, now about the pigeon. Yeah, and <laughs> the pigeon. Um, I believe th there was a couple different ways that those were triggered. One is that they set a timer, and um, but a, a lot of times, uh, like in that one, you know, I, I'm not clear on what they what they did because I know. Earlier, some of the stuff I read was talking about it had a timer that was for like, you know, eight minutes and they flew it and they just hoped it took the picture at the right time. Um, some of the balloons, for example, um, they had things like a, a parachute thing that they would send a wire up on the balloon and it would electrically trigger a, a parachute to drop a camera. Um, there's all kinds of different triggers. Some of it was manually pulling a cable. But as far as the birds, I think it was a timer that was a, a preset thing that they set on the ground. And I believe there was a dial on the top of that. I believe that's what it was, is they just turned that dial and said, well, we're going to try it this and we'll see what happens. So it was a trial. I think that one was a trial and error one. I didn't find any information directly. But when I looked at the dial, it made me think that's probably what it was. I'm not, I know in some cases, that's exactly what it was. Is they just had a little, little dial that was like a kitchen timer almost, and then that would trigger it after X amount of minutes. So they had to just guess. Not like nowadays. It's like you know, set it to take X amount of shots. It, you know, even the earlier drones that I that I flew, it would you could set it to do every ten seconds, for example, um, or you could take video and take whatever frame you want or a frame multiple frames which i did also but yeah back in the old days they had people with stuff with uh, uh wires going up on kites and they were using uh, gun power gunpowder to do flashes so on that one with 17 kites um they were using uh gunpowder uh to do to do lighting in some cases because there wasn't enough lighting so they'd get it up maybe 40 50 feet in the air and then they'd put out these huge flashes so they had all these people lined up and then making this massive flash and and the camera would you know they trigger trigger the camera but bef before that they'd fly them up and the, the shutter was was open and they just have to let it sit there for these long exposures and bring it down and they were blurry you know but the majority of the picture looked pretty good but it had kind of a ghost-like effect on some of the real early ones i know 
I played around with early time exposures back in the 70s and played with that sort of thing. <laughs> While it was fun to do, it didn't, didn't give you a nice clear image. That... I have a question. Have you seen any of the images from the little minis? Are they any good? Are they even worth uh, buying? Personally, I've just seen mm -hmm. what DJI, DJI promotes and they look pretty good on the on the documentation that they have but i have not i've seen them fly i've talked to people that fly them and say that their images are good but then i'm not talking to someone that's like a professional photographer so you know what the average joe says i think it's going to be a good picture there's going to be a big difference between with the technology you know they're getting 1080 video out of these really really small ones which looks pretty darn good and as far as the megapixel size you know, it should be good enough to get a, a pretty good image. It may not be as big as, as the, the one I have, but um, the one advantage that I like as far as panoramas, it, which I find really valuable, especially when I was doing the Inspire One, because that was a 12 megapixel camera. You take the little ones. If you've got something you really want to get a shot of, just take a panorama where you do shots to the left and do like five vertical or seven vertical and then move it a little bit, you know, over about a, you know, portion of a frame, third of a frame, and then take five more and then just keep doing that. And you end up with excess images, but then when you stitch them all together, you've got a pretty huge image. So the quality of the image, once you put that together is gonna to be extremely good compared to a single image. So even a small one, you know, if you're doing panoramas and you want to do still shots, it doesn't take too many images to make a lot bigger image. And then when you put it together and crop it in a little bit, you're going to end up with a really good image, even with the real small ones. I'm quite certain of that. I'm looking forward to the field trip. Yeah. <laughs> if, um, if there are a few people interested, we can definitely put something together. Um, I have mine with, like I say, with three batteries. So if we want to put something together, um, I, I'd say if you want to shoot me a email or we can, I don't know, who, who would be the best person to uh, uh, talk to in the club would be, you know, just to kind of start this. Tony's Tony, a field trip Tony is a field trip person. Yeah, yeah. Tony yeah, is our field trip person. It would be Ellen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have a location in mind of where you might um, go. I normally would go out to the coast. Uh -huh. and, yeah. You know, I technically they say, well, it's illegal to shoot in state parks, and if you go, like, let's say you go to. Uh, Hacienda Bridge to that um, little park there with the, these kids that are there collecting your money or whatnot, um, they will say, oh, no, you can't fly a drone there. And I would not. But when you go out to the coast, I've asked, I can't tell you how many r different rangers, and they say, as long as you're not flying around people, we don't give a crap. They really don't care. They have no, no problem with it. So as long as they're respectful in, anywhere up in the coast, Salt Point, uh, Goat Rock, there are people, so I t hesitate uh, less to do it at Goat Rock, but there are Salt areas. Point. What's that? Yeah, Salt, Salt Point is my uh, preference, and there's a number of spots in there that are pretty good. Yeah. Uh, that area where that interesting rock was at uh, is a common meeting spot up there, um, would be a good parking lot. A lot of people know, know the area. Um, Stillwater. Yeah, but if, yeah, salt. So anyway, Salt Point. There's there's a number of options up there, and if people don't want to go that far, uh, a number of good option. Another good option is uh, a little bit south of Go Rock. There's a number of little parking lots you could pull in. There's usually hardly anybody there, and you can bring it up and fly it out and get it out close to the you know close to the ocean and fly it down. Look at some cliffs and stuff. So that's a good. Um, it's not as quite as good as far as photographs, but one of my photographs in there was actually taken from that spot. And I, because it kind of looks back towards Go Rock and mm -hmm. a really nice sunset area. Mm -hmm. Depending on the on the distance, I would say either there or, or Salt Point would be the two, 
two spots I would choose to go. Cool. So if how, how many people are, are interested from, from the group we have here of going out on a field trip? All right, go. Okay, cool. So we got a good half a dozen people are saying there we go. Good. So, so are uh, you going to get your remote pilot certificate before we do this? <laughs> <laughs> I have to take my training yet. So that's 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 on the list to do. And I started to, and it was, uh, I think it's about a two hour process on that. So I will, I will be doing that before I fly it again. That's why I haven't put mine up in the air for months. And I just got this a couple of weeks ago. I got a notification about it and read through it and then went through the whole, you know, process and looked at it and I thought, oh man, I can't believe it. It went from a, a process which took a few minutes to now it's like a two hour certification to do. So it's a, it's much more involved and time consuming. But yeah, I'm I definitely will be will be doing that uh before we do anything else, before I even fly again for that matter. So good, good questions. Um, any other questions? I think we wore it out already or the subject out. <laughs> great images, beautiful images. Yeah. Really great. Good job. Thank Sorry. you. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. That's my first PowerPoint. So that was it was a good learning process for me and it <laughs> more ideas. Now I'm on to a, a podcast and doing video and audio for that is my my next <laughs> venture. But <laughs> that won't be many still images for sure. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Steve. Congratulations, Congratulations, you're a Steve. master. Thank you. You're a master. <laughs> Thanks.